Um, this is uh, going to be the first uh, of our webcasted presentations. Uh, this is a um, CME uh, that is being um, done through the auspices of the ASBMT, and it's uh, looking to uh, webcast, um, I would say, uh, well-recognized national and international authorities in areas uh, that are of general interest in the context of transplantation. So it's extremely appropriate, and I'm delighted to introduce Paul Richardson, uh, Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. He's going to be talking to us uh, about a topic uh, that is one of the second hats that he wears at this point. So in addition to his role as clinical director of the Jerome Lipper Myeloma Center, he's had a long-standing interest in VOD, and he's here to give us updates on uh, the experience uh, on the treatment and um, novel, perhaps, strategies to treat VOD. So, uh, Paul, without further ado, thanks. Um, thank you very much, John, and thank you, everyone, for coming this, uh, this afternoon. Um, it's actually a real privilege to present uh, two grand rounds this year on VOD because, frankly, the Dana-Farber Brigham Group have been such an important contributor, uh, in my view, to um, the development of novel strategies. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Stand biased with the, <laughs> with the technological challenges. Um, but anyway, suffice to say, it's great to be here, and thank you, John, for the invitation. What I wanted to do this afternoon was actually um, try and encompass in the time that we have an introduction to some of the newer understandings of the pathology of this syndrome because I think it will help us better platform then how we think both in terms of diagnosis and at the same time in emerging treatments that may have a role. And one thing I do want to touch on is the new nomenclature that's emerged around VOD um, with the proposal from George McDonald and Laurie DeLev that the syndrome be renamed sinusoidal obstruction syndrome or SOS. Um, notwithstanding the clinical implications of sharing that with patients. I think before we adopt it broadly, there needs to be recognized that there needs to be some consensus around this new nomenclature, and I'm going to touch on that um, because certainly at the moment um, the consensus view um, is by no means clear. Um, I think as we all recognize, regimen-related toxicity is the biggest challenge really in transplant that we face. In the interest of time, obviously, I'm not going to dwell on uh, graft versus host disease. I think it's reasonable to suppose, though, um, that vascular injury may contribute something to certain forms of GVH. But when we look at vascular injury and uh, microangiopathic damage in particular, three basic end organ syndromes stand out. The first and foremost is veno-occlusive disease, liver injury. Of course, idiopathic pneumonitis, uh, the idiopathic pneumonias are a very important clinical challenge, and there may well be a component of vascular injury that uh, uh, contributes to these. And rarer, but just as important in my view, is the emergence of the microangiopathic complications of transplant associated with renal dysfunction, or HUSTTP. Now, the um, challenge of these syndromes is that the, when they are associated with multi-organ failure, they're associated with a very high rate of death. And I think it's fair to say, as we explore the boundaries of transplant in our patients, in older patients with more complex and uh, sophisticated graft challenges and conditioning challenges, um, microangiopathic complications have become a whole new area of challenge. So to focus in terms of the specific end organ syndrome of VOD SOS, as it's now sometimes called, in terms of incidence, it's important to recognize that there's estimated to be about 5,000 cases of VOD every year in the United States. But it's important to note that the rate of severe disease is actually only about a third of that. It's relatively rare in that sense, but nonetheless extremely important because it's associated with such high mortality. I think it's important to recognize also the competing factors that are influencing frequency. And an important point to emphasize is the higher rate amongst children. In children, tandem transplantation, multiple alkylator regimens, and so forth um, continue to be used for obvious reasons because obviously allogeneic and full-dose transplantation, it can be curative in settings for children uh, perhaps to a higher degree than maybe the case in adults. And the role of reduced intensity conditioning in children um, has by no means achieved the same degree of usage that it has in adults. So this remains a clinical problem um, despite the fact that uh, reduced intensity conditioning has changed its frequency in the adult population to some extent. Now, in terms of our definition of this syndrome, it's summarized here. It's a clinical definition, 
typically painful hepatomegaly, jaundice with a bilirubin greater than two, greater than or equal to two, I'm sorry for that typo, fluid retention, weight gain and ascites. These are the sort of bedside phenomenology that we see. And typically onset is beyond uh, four, I should say, day plus 35 of stem cell infusion um, with other causes absent. Now the pathophysiology of the syndrome is complex. Basically, it's characterized first by primary injury to sinusoidal endothelium. Hepatocellular injury follows with hepatocellular necrosis dominating. Activation of stellate cells appears to be a key part of this syndrome in the context of extracellular matrix interactions within the liver parenchyma, and I'm going to come to that in more detail in a moment. And this results in a cascade of events that result in venular microthrombosis, fibrin deposition, ischemia within a critical area of the liver, and intense fibrogenesis. At the bedside, this is apparent as portal hypertension, hepatorenal syndrome, and that, of course, in turn leads to multi-organ failure and death. Now, just to give you an idea of how to think about this, this is a simple schematic of the architecture within the parenchyma of the liver. Just want to draw to your attention that the portal flow comes into here and in zone one, two, and three percolates through this microvasculature of the liver before reaching the efferent vein. And it's in this zone three, which we'll talk about in more detail in a moment, um, that the major injury occurs. These are some simple pictures of the syndrome. This is actually courtesy of Howie Shulman. And basically, this slide shows classic venular occlusion. You'll see this is a trichome stain, and it's showing the intense blue of fibrosis, the subendothelial edema, and the abluminal closing down of the venule, as you can see from without pressing down within. And this is, in fact, another picture, also courtesy of Howie, showing here a hepatocyte that has actually broken off and is actually within the lumen of the venule and obstructing it with this intense fibrotic reaction occurring around the outside. So it's a really unique pathology in that regard. This is just a further description, again, a slide from Howie showing this classical occlusion of the hepatic venules. Now, one of the debates that's arisen is this whole question of whether or not what is the primary injury that leads to the syndrome, and therefore, based upon that, should the syndrome be renamed, as I mentioned, SOS, or sinusoidal obstruction. And to sort of think about that question, I want to touch on sort of integrating the concept of the pathology and pathogenesis of the syndrome. In terms of the biochemical mediators of sinusoidal damage, I'm very grateful actually to Henri Carreras for kindly sharing with me these slides, which I've adapted a little for the talk today. But I think they were very helpful in certainly helping me understand some of the key events that lead to the syndrome and help argue this question of which comes first and, in fact, do you need all three together? I think what we're beginning to understand very clearly is that the generation of metabolites that are toxic to the endothelial cell are a key first step. This is why it occurs typically with high-dose conditioning. This is a schematic of the hepatic sinusoid illustrating this point with endothelial cells and hepatocytes and the space of DES illustrated here with the microvascular flow um, within the venule showed here. And what basically happens is sinusoidal flow occurs, plasma percolates, and actually diametrically you have lymph flow in the other direction. And then as you see in terms of uh, cytotoxic injury, this is actually a schematic of the metabolism of cyclophosphamide. You see the production of toxic metabolites such as acrolyne, the key role of the glutathione enzymatic system in breaking these down, and its disruptions to this process that lead to the injury um, that results in key damage to extracellular matrix and indeed um, to the hepatocellular uh, uh, framework of the liver parenchyma. And I just want to emphasize the role of other drugs as they come in. It's well believed, based upon the work of Laurie Delev and, and, and pioneers in the field like George MacDonald, that cyclophosphamide is a key platform, and in fact, a number of experiments support that. However, the contributory factor of other drugs is key, in particular, the busulfan, in depleting, for example, the glutathione enzymatic system and resulting in a cascade of injuries shown here. Now, endothelial damage is clearly primary. And basically, there are a number of lines of evidence to show this. I've summarized them here, actually, just from the context that if you reverse the order of the drugs given, you can change the toxicity profile that you see. If you give intravenous busulfan, there's less toxicity. And interestingly, if you decrease the TBI dose or increase the interval between side TBI, you can change the incidence of toxicity. And most recently, George MacDonald and his colleagues have pioneered the approach of adjusting doses of cyclophosphamide in an attempt to reduce the incidence of this syndrome. Having said that, that may or may not be practical. And in the diseases that we deal with, of course, in dose intensity pharmacologically and fully myeloblative transplants is very important. So again, just to show you in schematic form the cascade of injury that occurs 
basically within the liver sinusoid illustrated there, showing that damage to the subendothelium. Not sure if I can go back to it, but you can see here as the sinusoidal endothelial cells disrupt and damage, they open. And as these toxic metabolites damage this sinusoidal endothelium, so the platform for the beginning of this syndrome can begin. I also want to bring attention to nitric oxide and the metallo metalloproteinases, which are beginning to emerge as an area of key interest in this syndrome. Again, in the context of endothelial damage, there's a reduction in nitric oxide. There's increase in the activity of mat matrix metalloproteinases. Especially want to acknowledge the work of Laurie Delev in teasing out this uh, uh, platform. But what she's shown very nicely is that the inhibition of nitric oxide favors veno occlusive disease. And interestingly, the addition in animal systems of nitric oxide precursors prevents uh, VOD. And in, indeed, in her experimental models, the use of glutathione repletion um, can actually protect from VOD. And she's shown a very nice linkage with a reduction in metalloproteinase activity. So again, driving back to this schematic, which shows this intense injury in the subendothelial space here with damage to sinusoidal endothelium building up, you can see how the cascade of injury results in sinal, uh, sinusoidal blood flow obstruction. And this is the essential hypothesis that drives the concept between sinusoidal obstruction being the primary event that leads to this uh, disease. And post-sinal hypertension then follows. Now, one interesting area of controversy has been the role of procoagulant status. And in that context, what about other contributing factors that may add? Now, I think it's clear to us that pro-inflammatory cytokines play a vital role in this. Clearly, veno-occlusive disease is more common in allogeneic recipients, and there's much data to support that role. Interestingly, certain uh, uh, drugs that we use for graft versus host disease pro uh, prophylaxis may play a role, and other vasoactive mediators such as uh, endothelin-1 and VEGF and other factors may be very important. And I think there are a number of lines of evidence to support this. I just summarized them here by showing the higher incidence in allogeneic transplant, the higher incidence in unrelated allos versus related allos, and indeed um, the higher incidence in non-T-cell depleted allogeneic transplant versus T-depleted transplant, especially acknowledge the contribution from our own group led by investigators such as uh, Rob Seufer in nailing that down. And obviously we've learned for some time that patients with hepatitis or cirrhosis are particularly at risk of this uh, syndrome. Now, why are these events more common around the small intrahepatic veins around zone three, as I've illustrated here? And again, I'm grateful for Enrique for this uh, schematic because I think it summarizes it very nicely. And what he's showing here is that you have the central veins with the portal space. And again, around these key areas, you have zone one, two, and three. This zone three is the most vulnerable to ischemic injury and the most vulnerable to the beginning of this syndrome. Interestingly, in this area, it's also rich in P450, but where obviously there's enzymatic conversion of the drugs that I've alluded to, but also very importantly, it's depleted in glutathione. So you can see why um, there's a strong rationale um, for this being a primary site of injury. So to summarize what I've just shown you, when you see this syndrome, we believe that endothelial injury is a primary event and sinusoidal obstruction is key to its emergence. This leads to um, the reduced secretion of sodium from the kidney as part of portal hypertension. There's intense fluid retention and weight gain. This then results in hepatic ischemia with resultant hepatocellular necrosis. And as a result of that and a cascade of injury that occurs in the liver, there's stellate cell activation, the production of pro-fibrotic uh, molecules that contribute to this intense extracellular matrix reaction, which results in fibrosis of the hepatic sinusoids and veins and leads to the syndrome. So when we think of this debate of VOD versus SOS, and a number of us in the room have had this discussion, Vincent and I, for example, and Rob and others, it seems perhaps somewhat semantic. VOD versus SOS, perhaps um, really they constitute one spectrum of the same. And I think I was very interested to be at a meeting of the American Society of Liver Disease subcommittee led by a number of prominent liver hepatopathologists, including Howie Shulman. And really at that meeting, there was no clear consensus for the removal of the term VOD and the substitution of SOS. So at this point, I think most of us in the field feel until a consensus can be achieved, and that probably will require a meeting and perhaps some multi-center contributions in terms of pathology and understanding, the term VOD SOS has therefore been embraced. So to give you some idea of where this is going, um, that probably as much as anything um, captures it at least for the moment. One thing I want to touch on finally is this concept of procoagulant status. I think a lot of strategies have been targeted at the antithrombotic approach based upon the observations of a whole cascade of endothelial markers being elevated. It's certainly been one of the key platforms for our own work. And one of the fundamental questions has been, is this 
basically a primary event or is it actually uh, an epiphenomenon? Well, what we know therapeutically is that heparin and antithrombin-3 don't do much, certainly in the way that they've been tested so far. And we do know, interestingly, that TPA, however, certainly can engender response. And as I'll show you in a moment, its problem is it generates too much toxicity, catastrophic bleeding, importantly. But it does appear to only influence about a third of patients affected by this. And so one key unanswered question at this point remains, epiphenomenon or direct role? And I suspect, like a lot of things in medicine, it's probably neither one nor the other, but somewhere in between. Now, I want to change gears a bit and touch with you about other predisposing factors to this syndrome. A new agent that has emerged that's very important in the pathogenesis of a new form or part of the spectrum of VODS US you are seeing is that, that, that triggered by myelotarg exposure. And the first reports actually came um, some years ago now, but basically were uh, 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 platformed on the following. CD33 is, in fact, expressed on injured sinusoidal endothelium and, indeed, expressed on activated hepatic stellate cells. And in studies, this actually from the Seattle group, they were able to show that hepatic injury occurred in 11 of 23 patients in their series, 48%. And when they looked at histology, they saw intense sinusoidal fibrosis, sorry, fibrosis, I beg your pardon, centrilobular congestion and hepatocellular necrosis. And the mortality in these patients in this small series was high at 64%. And again, I'm grateful to Howie Shulman for this slide, but this is from actually one of the patients. And as you can see, the sinusoidal fibrosis is really striking. And it's actually quite different in some ways to what I showed you earlier of what we see in the classic transplant VOD. Now, to build on that, there have been a number of other experiences. Of course, because myelotype work was pioneered at the MD Anderson, the MD Anderson group were the first to describe this. I've already touched on the work from the Seattle group. And of course, basically, our own team, led by Martha Wadley here, published, I think, a very important paper in 2003 showing that prior gemtuzumab ozogomycin exposure prior to transplant increased your risk, particularly if it was within three months of allogeneic transplant. Now, what about differential diagnosis for this syndrome? A couple of things to mention. For the clinicians, it's always very challenging. Basically, in transplant, rapid, gain can occur, rapid weight gain can occur for lots of different reasons. Hepatomegaly, the same, and of course, jaundice can as well. And what's very interesting is with the use of drugs like ursodiol and indeed with pre-exposure to drugs like uh, myelotard, we're seeing less jaundice in some of our patients and more hepatorenal physiology. So even there, it can be complex. The other thing to mention is the timing of the syndrome. When does this occur? And this cartoon simply illustrates some of the more common causes of the syndrome at different times. Cholangitis lenta, which is associated with febrile neutropenia and a function probably of IL-2 effects on the hepatocyte. This is basically the jaundice of infection, can occur during the transplant and during the nadir. Venous occlusive disease, as I mentioned, typically occurs out to around day 35, but later forms are seen. And of course, the immunophilins can cause cholestasis, cyclosporin being the prime offender there, and of course, we use very little of that now. Acute GVH obviously typically occurs later, once the graft is in. Um, but I think it's fair to say with um, some of the rapid engraftments we see, um, its incidence in the liver may be coming a little earlier into the paradigm. Uh, basically, gallbladder sludging is very common in heavily transfused individuals who are not eating on antibiotics. Viral hepatitis tends to be later. Fungal infection, obviously, also an important other consideration, but again later, as is um, HBV uh, and HCV. Now, one thing we've found in our own studies is that the use of ultrasound in VOD has actually been quite uh, helpful. You can confirm it's hepatomegaly, which interestingly can sometimes be a little difficult to dis dis uh, discern in the distended abdomen. Ascites can sometimes be relatively difficult to also be absolutely sure about. Uh, attenuated hepatic venous flow, however, and especially portal vein reversal, has been very helpful, we found, um, in helping diagnostic certainty. Doppler ultrasound, as I've mentioned, we found useful. Uh, resistive indices from hepatic arterial flow has been somewhat uh, less uh, reproducible outside of the centers that originally did it. But I think it's important to recognize that ultra, 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 ultrasound helps us exclude pericardial effusion, constricted pericarditis, and other potential causes. However, the gold standard in this disease remains transvenous liver biopsy and pressure measurement. Very important to include the wedged hepatic pressure me measurement because this takes a little while to come back. And with very sick patients, an elevated WHVPG can be very useful in helping us have some degree of diagnostic certainty. A couple of uh, practical points. Patients with this syndrome are classically thrombocytopenic, so we do require adequate platelet count. 
Um, moreover, they can be profoundly coagulopathic. In our own hands, we found the use of factor seven concentrates in the setting actually quite useful to improve the safety of the procedure. There is no role for percutaneous uh, liver biopsy in this setting. The rates of uh, complications are simply too high. The transfemoral transjugular method is clearly the better way to go um, if you do this. And we've had some success with the transfemoral approach if you have a very sick patient who, for example, is intubated and on a ventilator. Wedged hepatic venous, um, wedged hepatic venous pressure gradient measurement, I'm sorry, greater than 10 has a 91% specificity and an 86% positive predictive value based on a series from Seattle. And certainly in our hands, we found the very high, high wedge pressures of 20 or above helpful in nailing the diagnosis. So having talked a bit about diagnosis and obviously previously about pathology, what's very clear at the bedside is that there is a true spectrum of this, in, in, in this syndrome. Uh, ranging from the mild subclinical syndrome to the moderate, which requires relatively modest intervention, analgesia, uh, diuretics, uh, minimization of hepatotoxins, and so forth. And then what is the much feared and deadly? The severe but treatable, as you noticed, I've deliberately put in a very small bar here, versus the severe and fatal, for which we've got a large bar, because that remains our primary challenge to avoid this, and if it does occur, how do we best treat, treat it? Now, one of the biggest challenges is how on earth do we prognosticate? How do we know who's going to do that? Well, there have been a number of efforts at this, and probably the best to date has been that work by Scott Bierman and colleagues in Seattle, where Scott um, developed a predictive model based upon the rate of rise of bilirubin and the rate of weight gain. Now, this model was only validated out to day plus 16 after graft infusion and was only specific to three conditioning regimens, CITBI, BUSI, and CBV. So in that regard, in the modern era, it now has some limitations. Also, with the advent of versadiol and the introduction of drugs like Mylotard, bilirubin may be less predictive of exactly what's going on. What has remained, however, a sine qua non of severity has been multi-organ failure. In every series, multi-organ failure has consistently um, predicted for dismal outcome. In fact, we've just completed a large review over the last 10 years of numerous studies, and there, basically, those patients in whom multi-organ failure occurs, um, the mortality is clearly well in excess of 80 percent, um, supporting that position. However, the biggest single, uh, single center or multi-center series that have been carried out in any way prospectively have shown that severe VOD, certainly in these studies, have had mortalities in excess of 90 percent, approaching 100 percent if one looks at the data of McDonald from his original seminal paper in the annals some years ago and from Henri Carreras and the EBMT uh, in 1998. This is just a quick graphical illustration of the Beerman model that was published some years ago in the JCO. And as you can see, there are various uh, Cox regression analyses were used to generate these curves, but they're curves that are generated that can help you at the bedside predict from total bilirubin and actual percent weight gain at the time of this in the context of the conditioning <coughs> regimen and graft reinfusion, how a patient may do. Please note that these are not actually mortality curves. They're just curves that predict the risk of subsequently developing uh, uh, um, severe VOD and death. The reason this model was primarily developed, however, was a practical one. Scott at this time was pioneering the use of TPA in these patients who were profoundly coagulopathic and at very high risk of bleeding complications. And so therefore it behoved him to have a model system that he could use to justify a highly risky therapy in a patient who might go on to subsequently die of this hepatic complication. This is again from the seminal paper by George MacDonald in the annals some years ago now. And as you can see here in his series, and it was a cohort study of 355 patients, he showed that actually in the severe syndrome, basically the median weight gain was 15%. Uh, the maximum total serum bilirubin seen in these patients overall was 26 the majority had peripheral edema, and about half had ascites. And in this series, he lost almost all of his patients at day 100. Important to note, though, that even in the moderate patients, the mortality rate um, was significant at 20% um, in this series. Probably the best series that we have to date is that of Henri Carreras and the EBMT, published in Blood at the end of uh, 1998. This was a prospective cohort study, actually in 1,600 patients at 73 centers across the EBMT. And basically, they identified a lower incidence and rate of VOD than had been expected, at just 5% in the European centers. And we can discuss what that might be later. But about a third of these patients had severe disease, which again is consistent with the experience in the United States. Allo, far more common, three times more than auto, 
Interestingly, in this study, they looked at heparin as an, a, a prophylactic agent and showed it to be ineffective. But what was very uh, uh, important was that if you looked at all cause day plus 100 mortality in this prospective study, it was 100%. So when we think of this disease, how do we then think about interventions? What can we do to fix it? Well, obviously, prevention is vital, and I show this simply to uh, illustrate the construct that we could perhaps look at altering conditioning, we could identify genetic predisposition, there may indeed even be epidemiologic stratification that we could look at um, to identify risk. Ursodiol has taken on uh, some purchase as a useful benign agent that converts the bile acid pool from its water insoluble uh, component to its water soluble component. Interestingly, you have to give it two to three weeks before the patient comes in for conditioning to really make a difference. I can't say that we rigorously stick to that paradigm, but nonetheless, studies by a number of investigators have shown that ursodiol can reduce the degree of oxidant stress in the liver and that this may have implications not only for VOD or liver injury, but interestingly also for liver GVH. Now, drug levels I've already touched upon, these are clearly very important. The use of busulfan monitoring for the oral drug was vital. IV busulfan has fortunately changed that, and the cyclophosphamide story is emerging. Glutathione repletion has always been very interesting, and certainly there have been a number of studies looking at nutritional supplements to try and minimize uh, VOD risk and liver injury. However, so far, data have been somewhat mixed. Now, what about inflammation? We touched on the fact that this is more common in the allogeneic setting. Can you, by reducing inflammation, have a major impact on this syndrome? Well, interestingly, some early efforts at this showed promise in preliminary trials, but phase three studies, unfortunately, were negative. Pentoxifiline, which some of you may remember, inhibits TNF and basically was thought to be potentially useful. What was very interesting, though, is that in the actual control study of its use, it caused more VOD than not, probably because it has effects on adenosine receptors, which are important modulators of cell injury. And that may be why there was a higher rate. But suffice to say, other approaches to immuno, uh, uh, immunosuppression have not been shown to be meaningfully important in VOD. Clearly, the biggest focus has been how do we target microvascular injury and how do we target particularly sinusoidal injury because that appears to be the primary uh, uh, event that occurs in the syndrome. And there have been a number of efforts looking at, for example, the prostaglandins at pharmacological doses, active in small series, but unfortunately too toxic in larger trials. Heparin, as I've mentioned, has not been uh, useful. Activated protein C has been tested, associated with bleeding complications in the studies that were done in Asia. Antithrombin-3, certainly to date, apart from some benefit in multi-organ failure patients, has been negative, and the prophylactic trial clearly was. Low molecular weight heparin has also been studied, with some anecdotal data suggesting there may be a role in at least prophylaxis, but not for established disease. Now, what about established VOD when you've got the whole constellation of events going on? Well, TPA I'm going to come to in a moment, and then in the last part of the talk, we'll touch on the fibrotide. Finally, there is one other approach, which is that, of course, of liver transplantation and TIPS. I think it's fair to say this belongs very much in the supportive care category. Um, uh, basically, intraperitoneal shunting or TIPS may be a useful supportive measure, but if you're not doing it in the face of effective therapy for the underlying syndrome, it's very unlikely to have any benefit. And the high mortality in the case series uh, in which it's been tried, I think, support that. Liver transplant obviously has very limited feasibility in this setting, um, but may be feasible in an occasional patient. Um, charcoal hemofiltration as a supportive strategy um, may be just that. It can get your bilirubin down, but it doesn't seem to fix the primary process. And we certainly have found that CVVHD and approaches to best supportive care can certainly potentially buy you time. But at the end of the day, if you're not fixing the underlying problem, um, the outcome is the same. Sorry, right. So this is a, a, a table um, of the TPA experience to date. And basically, I put it all here with the smaller series illustrated, but I've actually put in red the larger series that go into double figures to illustrate the point. And really, I think the best study published in blood uh, at the end of uh, 1998 was that by Scott Bierman and colleagues, um, basically, where they treated 42 patients with um, severe VOD, with a dose escalation of uh, TPA, um, followed by heparin. Um, the TPA duration was two to four days. Um, they had responses in about a third of patients. Unfortunately, they showed an equal number of life-threatening hemorrhage. And so Scott's conclusion from this paper was that whilst there may be a response rate to TPA, it should never be given to patients with multi-organ failure. All of his deaths were in the multi-organ failure population, and all of his complications were in the MOF population as well. And if you're going to use TPA, you should only use it early or not at all.
And that leaves us in a fundamental, quadri uh, a fundamental quandrum because at the, at the outset, if you're going to use this drug, it may be very hazardous. And if you have patients without multi-organ failure, it's difficult to know how they will do. So this, I think, best exemplifies the challenge we face. Also, very importantly in his series, even with TPA therapy, the overall mortality for this series was very high uh, at over 80%. Now, in terms of other experiences, they've been basically very similar, um, with high mortality rates overall, um, showing that the benefit of this approach um, is at best modest, and that whilst the response rates are there, suggesting there may be some pharmacological effect, the rates of complication from unacceptable bleeding are simply too high. So it's based upon that sort of platform that maybe endothelial cell injury being modulated as an important event in this disease um, that we sought to develop novel approaches that were based on the following premise, that you should be able to protect the patient without compromising anti-tumor effect. That's actually very important. But at the same time, obviously do so in a way in which you don't cause unacceptable toxicity. And also we were looking for candidate agents that preferably would have an activity in a spectrum of vascular injury syndromes during transplant. In the interest of time, just going to focus now on defibrotide. It's been the candidate drug we've been exp uh, exploring for some time. There may be derivatives from this that we'll be looking at further in the future. But defibrotide has become the, the single agent in the setting that we've tested the most rigorously. When we first started using this clinically, little was really understood about it. It's actually a polydispersed oligonucleotide and it falls into the new category of this oligonucleotide pharmacology, which has gained considerable interest in other aspects of oncology for various different reasons. So for what is polydispersed oligonucleotide? Well, it belongs, it belongs to the oligonucleotide class. It's a DNA drug. Mm -hmm. And of course, you've got that whole field encompasses agents like antisense agents, um, and that are supposed to putatively get into the nucleus, into the cytoplasm, and alter gene expression and gene transcription. This agent actually seems to be much more cell surface active. And it's very interesting when you talk to other uh, scientists exploring oligonucleotides that they see these cell surface effects um, that may explain a lot of the pharmacology of these drugs. So polydispersed basically stands for not otherwise testified. Multiple bits. If you look at it, there's lots of chunks. And it may explain a lot of actually some of its diverse pharmacology. It's not gen gen engineered. It's with multiple pieces. And basically, it does appear to have specific sites on the vascular endothelium, very interestingly on adenosine receptors. Uh, and that is important because adenosine receptors control cellular responses to injury. And I think what's been most interesting about this, and you know, in myeloma, we love to say this, you know, we like dirty drugs in myeloma. If they hit multiple times, they do lots of things. And interestingly enough, defibrotide certainly falls into this category. It does lots of things. It has anti-thrombotic properties. It's anti-ischemic. It's pro-fibrinolytic. Very interestingly, it's anti-adhesive and it's anti-apatotic. Now, a lot of people say, well, how on earth is it doing all of that? Well, we've got some very interesting work emerging that's preliminary that suggests that it actually has an ability to bind low affinity heparin binding proteins and also, interestingly, has effects on, age, on, on proteins such as heparinase. Anyway, in model systems, it's also been shown, sorry, my point is running out of juice here, um, to have activity on, microvas on microvasculature in various uh, uh, model systems by, tested by a number of scientists. And I want to show one as an example. This is Anna Falanga and her group from Bergamo, published in Leukemia now a few years ago, where she compared a macrovascular model to a microvascular model using LPS stimulation and showed a very interesting differential effect of defibrotide in this model system, where she was able to demonstrate the suggestion of a protective role against toxic stimuli in small vessels as opposed to large. Further work by Gunter Eisner from the group at Regensburg in Germany, this is Ernst Holler's group, was very interesting, I think. This was published in Blood some years ago now, where he looked at a protective or demonstrated a protective effect of defibrotide in a transplant model of fludarabine induced apoptosis, activation, and allogenicity in human endothelial and epithelial cells um, using this model system. And what was particularly important is that he showed no abrogation of anti tumor effect in the leukemic cells that they used in this system. And from our own group in work led by Constantine Mitsiades and presented at several ASH meetings now and actually has provided a platform for an ongoing phase 1-2 study in Italy led by Antonio Colombo, we've been able to show that defibrotide actually can be adjunctive to chemotherapy in preclinical models. And very interestingly, whilst it itself doesn't have cytotoxic effects, when combined um, with cytotoxic agents, it can actually, we think, through targeting adhesion and other pathways, um, confer no protective effect on tumor, very important, that was the key premise of the original experiment, but at the same time may actually enhance 
some of the anti-tumor effects of the agents. And this may also seem you know, very puzzling. How come it's doing so many interesting things in this regard? But our fundamental hypothesis is that if you have injured endothelium, if you can turn the activated injured endothelium off, that may both reduce toxicity and at the same time may enhance anti-tumor effect in tumors that are dependent on this activated endothelium. But anyway, just to focus specifically um, on the effects in terms of VOD, this is a schematic that illustrates the microenvironment or the milieu within which the sinusoidal endothelial cells sit, the extracellular matrix and the hepatocytes. And our working hypothesis is that defibrotide, through its pleiotropic effects, um, abrogates the sinusoidal endothelial uh, cell injury um, that is key to this event. Now, what clinical evidence do we have to support that? Well, from our original observations some years ago now in, comp in the compassionate use setting where we illustrated in the 19 patients, all with multi-organ failure and severe VOD, a complete response rate defined as 42% with a day plus 100 survival and 30%. I should mention that in the TPA data that I just showed you, response there was defined as a 50% reduction in bilirubin, not complete response as illustrated here, which is a bilirubin of less than two and resolution of VOD-related multi-organ failure. A European series followed and reproduced these results, and a larger series involving multiple centers across the U.S. also showed very similar data. And then a recent publication by Asleem Kukibaglu from Germany um, showing in the pediatric population encouraging results. And similarly, Dr. Bully and colleagues published just this year in a small pediatric series also very promising results in patients with severe VOD. In our blood paper, we were able to show that in terms of better outcome, younger patients did better. Abnormal portal flow, interestingly, which had normally been associated with worse outcome in other series, was actually associated with better outcome in ours. And we saw this as interesting, and perhaps, and this again is a hypothesis, did this reflect sinusoidal obstruction where we think the drug may be working? And if that's the case, perhaps those who are sinusoidally obstruction dominated, if you will, versus hepatocellular necrosis dominated, which might be something more of busulfan-based injury. Perhaps these patients benefit more from defibrotide. Interestingly, autos did better than allos. That perhaps is just a function. But in the allogeneic setting, when you have multi-organ failure and liver failure in particular, the sequelae are very complex. Interestingly, conversely, worse outcome was associated with bucontaining conditioning, patients with encephalopathy, which may actually correlate with the two. And not unsurprisingly, if you had multi-organ failure in three or four systems, you did worse. What was interesting to us, too, is if we looked at the continuous variables in this study, we saw that reduction of PI-1 was associated with response and better outcome, as interestingly was reduction in serum creatinine, again pointing to this uh, hepatorenal <coughs> axis, perhaps. Interesting, conversely, reduction in bilirubin did not necessarily predict, or the rate of reduction in bilirubin did not necessarily predict for better outcome, or trended towards it, but didn't achieve significance. So in any event, based upon these studies, we had an encouraging response rate, an encouraging day plus 100 survival. Intrapatient dose escalation had been pursued. No significant toxicities with these studies had been reported. The key question was, what was the best dose? On that basis, we launched a multi-center uh, a new United States North American trial to compare 25 versus 40 milligrams per kilo per day. I'll move through this quickly because many of you are very familiar with this, but we presented the final results um, at ASH this last December. 151 patients enrolled, 150 treated, equal randomization between the two arms. 150 patients completed therapy, I should say, and 141 were available for response, with all of them available for survival. In terms of the patient characteristics, they're summarized here. The median age was 36. They were dominated by leukemics. Allografts dominated, as one might expect. Psi-based conditioning also dominated. And interestingly, uh, 20 of the patients had had prior myelotide exposure. And indeed, 26 had been exposed to the combination of rapamycin and uh, tacrolimus also. A smaller number had prior features that would be associated risk, as, as risk factors for VOD. These were the characteristics of study entry. The median bilirubin was five, ranging up to 43 for one of the patients. This one patient, who actually was not icteric, had biopsy-proven VOD and had been previously exposed to myelotard. His wedged hepatic venous pressure gradient at biopsy was actually 30. It's a patient of Rob's, and he actually went on to do quite well and responded to treatment. The median weight gain was 12%. And almost all of the patients had multi-organ failure in two or more systems. And as you can see, the characteristics here certainly support the notion that these were very sick patients, with almost all of the patients having ascites, uh, three-quarters having documented right upper quadrant pain and hepatomegaly, and abnormal portal flow in 
And what we're very encouraged to report with this study is that the complete response rate is actually 46% in the 141 patients evaluable for response, with no significant difference between high dose versus low dose, although interestingly, there was a difference favoring the low dose arm in the children. Very interestingly, for patients exposed to biomilotarg, the response rate was also very uh, encouraging, and interestingly, fairly equal too for those patients on both rapamycin and uh, 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 tacrolimus. Now, of course, the benchmark here is survival. What about day plus 100 survival? And this is for all patients. It was 41%, which certainly was superior to what we'd have expected based upon historical controls. This is a, a Kaplan-Meier estimate of the survival showing no difference between the two <coughs> arms. In terms of the toxicology, interestingly, whilst it didn't achieve significance, we saw more bleeding um, with the higher dose arm. A few <coughs> things about predictors of uh, response, and I want to be very fast in the interests of time. Basically, a lot of these patients were obviously on dialysis and ventilator dependent. And if you had all of these things, you did less well. If you were earlier and your multi-organ failure was less severe, you did better. And perhaps there's no surprise um, to that. We also had an exhaustive effort in endothelial stress markers. And certain markers jumped out, including PI-1 and protein C, as well, interestingly, as antithrombin-3 and nitric oxide. Um, others predicted for actual uh, treatment failure in the form of endothelial stress. And just in the interest of time, I want to move on very quickly to pharmacokinetics. We looked at pharmacokinetics, too, to see if there was a difference. And what was quite interesting is we didn't see a big difference between the two doses. So it may well be that one of the reasons that the outcomes were similar is that the pharmacokinetic effect was different. One other piece of this trial that will be very important is that of pathology. And Howie Shulman is our collaborator and our central pathologist for this study. And he's looking at pathology in a blinded fashion to outcome and we're hoping that we'll generate from that information that may further enrich and, 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 and obtain precision for looking at who responds and who doesn't. One of the most interesting things that may have clinical application here is in radiology. And in this regard, we've developed a model system uh, with our collaborators in the radiology group to look at a VOD scoring method to see if that may help us. And again, in the interest of time, we made the following observations that in these patients, for example, they had reversal of flow that then became anti-grade, obviously, with treatment, but interestingly, their biochemical parameters didn't necessarily uh, correspond with response at that time. So the idea of this system is that can we use it in some way to help us predict response to follow patients ahead of those other things, and we'll see when we do that. So the conclusion of the dose binding trial is really as follows, that the CR rate in day plus 100 we thought were very encouraging in terms of the CR rate at 46% and the day plus 100 survival at 41%. The toxicity profile has been very favorable, and both doses appear effective. Better outcome clearly seems to be associated with younger age, and for those patients with worse outcome, they appear to have advanced multi-organ failure, such as ventilator dependence, dialysis dependence, and encephalopathy. And if they have persistence of abnormal portal flow, that is not a good sign either. Now, where do we go with all of this? On the last minute or two, I just want to summarize of what we're doing now. We did a pilot exercise in looking at historical controls in a blinded fashion and were able to show a significant difference in this pilot. This is actually a more case-matched approach showing the difference as well at centers who did not have access to the vibratide. And this provided the rationale, given the fact that we were given the mandate by the FDA to test this drug in severe VOD, and we all felt as investigators that it was simply unethical and impossible to offer placebo to patients with this syndrome in its severe form that we should use a novel historical control methodology with all the risk that that carries. And the reason we felt the risk wasn't <coughs> unacceptable in terms of drug approval, of course, was what I just showed you from that pilot study. Having said that, it's a monumental task to do an adequately controlled and rigorous historical control. On that basis, we're currently going forward with a 36-center pivotal trial looking at patients with severe VOD characterized by multi-organ failure with an outback sequential chart review at every single participating site, consecutive patients, and that for those who meet the entry criteria for the study, enter into a database, and then in a blinded fashion are assessed for outcome with a medical review committee. I'm not sure if this is moving forward now. Sorry, um, beg your pardon, it's not working. <laughs> Maybe, oh, sorry. This is a schema of the trial, and basically summarizes the uh, uh, rationale jaundice uh, features of Baltimore criteria, multi-organ failure. They're treated according to the uh, 25 milligram dose that we identified from dose finding, and they're treated for 21 days, and the endpoints include complete response rate and day plus 100 survival. This is the current status. We have 61 patients enrolled on the treatment arm, and we have actually already completed almost 6,000 chart reviews for the historical control.
Interestingly, the estimated rate of VOD at the moment is actually in the severe form 2 to 4 percent. So we're expanding our, our effort in the historical control because obviously that's very important as we go forward. Very important as well is for those patients who are not eligible for this pivotal trial, a treatment IND is about to be launched so that those patients who don't qualify for this pivotal trial also have access to defibrotide. And for those of us on the floor, that's welcome news um, because the compassionate use approach has been a real challenge. <coughs> Finally, what about prophylaxis? Well, there's some very compelling evidence coming from Europeans that this may be a reasonable approach. This was published in BBBMT a few years ago by Shalondon and colleagues um, from Switzerland. There was a subsequent paper earlier this year from the Royal Marsden Group showing a benefit to defibrotide in prophylaxis compared to historical controls. There is actually now a prophylactic trial going on with the EBMT in children, led by Salim Kokibaglu and colleagues in the EBMT, and has actually already enrolled 183 pediatric patients. So we'll have a pediatric signal probably from the EBMT very soon. On that note, there is actually a prospective randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study on the efficacy of defibrotide planned that will be the first of its kind, linking the EBMT under the leadership of Did uh, Benidovisa with the CTN under the leadership of Rob Seufer, um, looking at the prophylaxis of this approach in high-risk allogeneic um, BMT. So to conclude, very quickly driving back, I think everyone agree we need a bit of consensus on VOD SOS versus VOD SOS. I think it's reasonable to use that terminology now if one's uncomfortable with VOD alone. Definition of severity, multi-organ failure. Prevention of VOD is a priority, so it's particularly good to see this joint EBMT-CTN trial coming in a prophylaxis for defibrotide, and hopefully we'll see many other new agents added to that, hopefully in the future. Obviously, the treatment of VOD requires urgently new therapies. I think it's reasonable to suggest that defibrotide constitutes the most promising agent in that regard, but we've clearly got much work to do, as illustrated here with the development of genetic and ethelial imaging data as diagnostic and prognostic tools. And obviously, importantly in this population, we're hoping that this novel trial design, such as the one that I just showed you, will allow us to meaningfully support new drugs evaluation in this rare but deadly disease. I'll just close by acknowledging all my co-investigators, in particular the clinical team, our biostatisticians, our research pharmacy team, I don't know quite where they went, but they were on this slide before, the laboratory studies, the radiology team, the pathology team, our sponsor Gentium for defibrotide, very importantly, FDA Orphan Drugs Products Program for defibrotide, they've been a, a fabulous support to us. Um, the nurses and house staff teams are vital. And right here in the corner, I apologize, this should be right in the middle, patients and their families. Thank you.